friends, um, this is module number 26 and in this module we're going to go over how to calculate the KSP of a base called calcium hydroxide. Okay, and there's really two parts to this um, lesson or module. The first part is really just to show you how to do a titration, and that's really the biggest part of our lesson because in grade 12 that's a big thing. We're working all year in order to be able to do a titration. So this would have been the lab that we would do in order to practice all of our skills, hone our calculations and get everything ready so that we'd be then ready to do our lab practical at the end of the semester. Okay. So I want to go through how to do a titration, how to use all the equipment you would use, how to do the calculations. And so to do that, we're going to do the lab um, that we would have done where we're going to calculate the KSP. And in order to calculate the KSP, we need to know the concentration of the ions that are in calcium hydroxide. And so to get the concentration of those ions, we're going to do a titration in order to figure it out. So this really means that we don't know what the concentration of the base is. And so you can see on the sheet here where I've got, this is my unknown base concentration. I know how much base I'm going to use in my titration because I'm going to use some of the equipment down below here to put exactly 10 milliliters of my base into my Erlenmeyer flask. Okay, so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to titrate my base with a known acid. And so that means that I know what the concentration of the acid is going to be. And I'm going to figure out how much acid is going to be used in order to neutralize that base. So I'm going to use what I figure out in the titration using the burette and reading the volume that I dispense and I'm going to use that volume and the known concentration to do a little stoichiometry to take my known concentration, my known volume and calculate my unknown concentration of the base. And then <clears throat> we'll be able to use that unknown concentration of my calcium hydroxide in order to calculate the KSP. Okay, so there are really two parts. Calculating using um, a titration method to figure out the unknown concentration and then once we've got an unknown concentration we can do lots of things with that including calculating the KSP. So the first thing I want you to notice is that I've got lots of little lab equipment set out here so I just took a quick picture of everything that we're going to use in the lab and then you're going to watch the little video right now that I made on how to use the pipette and how to read the burette and then I'm going to go from the video that I made previously and I'm going to talk about the notes. So the notes that we're using for this lesson are pages 21 to 24. So when I pause the video, um, I'd like you to pause as well and have a look through the lab instructions. Then you're going to watch the sequence of video as to how to use the pipette and the burette and then I'm going to go through the notes on page number 23 and then we'll do the calculations on page 24. So there's quite a bit of work involved in this lesson but I don't think it'll be too tricky for you. One of our pipettes looks like I didn't bring home um, the other kinds that we have, but this is what we call a Moore's pipette. And you can see that it starts at zero up here and goes all the way down to 10. The picture that's in your notes is of a volumetric pipette, and you would use a volumetric pipette if you wanna add in a specific volume. So in our titration, if we wanted to add exactly 10 mils, we would use the volumetric pipette where there's only one graduation to show you what you've got for 10 mils. This one would be one if you wanted to dispense like two mils or three mils, and you could actually use the graduations to help you figure that out. Okay, how do you use a pipette? Step number one, you use either one of the pipette aids or the pipette bulbs and you simply attach it to the top of the pipette, okay? So it's nice and snug. Then you will set your pipette into your liquid. And for this one, I just added some food coloring to the blue, to the water just so you could see it. And then you simply let the volume go up, okay? Now, this is like the easy version of using a um, a pipette aid. You always want to go farther than the graduation allows so that as the bottom of the pipette stays in the liquid, you could simply take the top off and put your finger on it over uh, to sort of hold it and then dispense it as it goes. But for this one, it's really quite easy because 
it will hold and the volume of the liquid in your pipette. So what you wanna do for this one, if you put it a greater than 10 mils, lift it out of the liquid, and then you could simply put it down and you can see how that dispenses some of the liquid in here. Now, if I've gone over my mark, that's okay. I can simply just go down into the liquid and bring it up again, okay? If it goes too far, then here's what you need to do. And I'll show you how to do that using the other one, okay? So if I take this pipette aid off and I use the pipette bulb instead, you simply put it over to the top like this. Then here's where you would have to squeeze it in, okay? So let's pretend I don't have anything in here to begin with. So squeeze it in. Now hold it in, put it underneath the liquid, and then draw the volume of the liquid up. And if this one doesn't have enough suction to be able to bring it up to the volume that you would need, this one actually does, but if you didn't, you would simply take the bulb off and put your finger over top of it, okay? The, the thing that people try to do is you, your inclination is to normally put your thumb over top of it, but you don't wanna do that. You just wanna use your index finger because you have much more control with your index finger, okay? And then simply at eye level, you can drop it down until the meniscus is exactly where you want it at zero. You tip the bottom of the pipette against the beaker to let all the drips go down, and then you would go ahead and dispense it into the container that you've got. So if you wanted to pour or dispense 10 milliliters into an Erlenmeyer flask, then you would put it into your Erlenmeyer flask, and you would simply let it go all the way until it reaches the final mark, and then stopper it up, tip the bottom against the glass beaker, or the Erlenmeyer flask and get rid of any little droplet. This is an interesting pipette. They're all different, right? But this one here wants you to stop it exactly at the 10. And that is calibrated so that this is one, two, three, all the way to 10. What's left in the tip is supposed to be left in the tip. There are other pipettes though that you wanna dispense all of the volume of the liquid. All right, so what I've got set up here is our setup, that, our apparatus that you would use if you're going to be doing a titration. So this is the burette, and the burette is attached with the burette clamp to the retort stand, and then I've got two containers down here. This is really just used for a, as sort of like a waste beaker, because you're gonna wanna have that there for any time you need to dispense a little bit of the liquid from the burette. Okay, so the first thing I wanna show you is how to read the volume on the burette. So I'm just gonna dispense a little bit from the burette and you can see that you've got the stopcock here connected to the tip, connected to the burette. Do you also notice that it's 50 mils recorded here and zero at the top? That's really important, okay? And when you're reading the burette, you read from the top down. You'll take an initial volume and a final volume, and that's how you get the volume of acid or base, whatever's in your burette, to use for your calculation. So remember, you're gonna have an acid and you're gonna have a base. One is gonna be down below, and one is gonna be in the burette. The whole point of this is for you to have three things that you know and only one unknown. So in this example that we're gonna do for the lab, I have in my Erlenmeyer flask a base. Okay, I put in here 10 milliliters exactly using the volumetric pipette. And this is what the concentration is that is going to be my unknown. This is my base, unknown concentration, known volume. In the burette, I've put in here an acid. I know exactly the concentration of the acid that I've added in. And using the method of titration, I'm gonna figure out the volume of the acid that was used in order to reach the end point of the titration. So that's where I have three things I will then know, the concentration of the acid, the volume that was used, the concentration of the base is my unknown, but I already know the volume that I've added in here, okay? So then you're just gonna use your stoichiometry to figure out the one unknown. Remember, you could have your acid up here and your base down here, or you could have your base up here and your acid down here. It doesn't matter which way you do the titration, okay? For this lab, our purpose was to figure out the concentration of the base. This is what our unknown concentration is, okay? For the burette. So you control the burette using the stopcock. So let me just show you how you do that. You wanna set it up so that you have your hand, then the burette, 
and then the valve. And you notice that you can just sort of tip it around. You can move it to however you want so that it's comfortable for you. You find that when you're working in the lab, it's nice to have your elbows or your arms sort of um, used as a balance point against the counter. All right, and you can do that because then that gives you a nice control over the valve. When you move it up and down, the valve is completely open and you can see how it drips as a full stream, okay? As soon as I move the valve sideways and it can go either way, then that's when it's closed, okay? So you wanna get practiced at opening the valve so that it produces a drop and only one drop at a time of your titrant, which is what's in your burette, into your um, beaker or flask, okay? So now what I'm gonna do to start with is I'm gonna close it up. I'm gonna take that last tip of liquid that's sitting there, drop it in my waste beaker, and now I'm gonna get ready for my titration. So step number one is to get my initial volume. So have a look here. If you put the white card reader behind it, <clears throat> you read from the top down and you read it to its limits. So you wanna have two decimal places. So can you see that that reads 8.70 probably? You read underneath the meniscus curve, okay? And yeah, you wanna make sure you get that at eye level. That's the volume that you record. That is your initial volume. Again, you read from the top down and it's always gonna be a smaller volume than your final volume. To get the change in volume, you'll take the final minus the initial and that's the volume of titrant that you've used. Okay, so I'm all ready to go. now. I move my waste beaker out of the way and I take my Erlenmeyer flask where I know the exact volume of the base that I have in here. Don't forget, you need to add an indicator. The indicator that we're gonna use is phenolphthalein. Now, I add the indicator to the Erlenmeyer flask. If this was an acid, what color would it go? It'd be colorless, right? But this is going to be a base because I put the base in here. So what happens when a base mixes with two or three drops of phenolphthalein? There we go, fuchsia. I've got my indicator in here. I'm all ready to go. My end point is going to be when it goes colorless and then back to colored. So I stick it underneath the tip of my burette, okay? And then I get ready to go. The first one you do is it can be like a quick run. So you can add is, um, you know, fairly quickly to see when that end point's going to be. Now, I'll get it going. And then I just wanna show you how to swirl your flask. Can you see that, James? Basically, you wanna get it so that the end of the, the edge of the Erlenmeyer flask is basically on the counter and you sort of swirl like this, okay? You swirl it so you get a nice uh, motion. What's happening in my flask is that the acid and the base are coming together. They're producing a salt and a water, okay? And I always like to show this with my little, um, my molecules, right? You've got your hydroxide from my base, I've got my hydrogen ions from my acid, and when they come together, they make water. So they're neutralizing the acid and the base and they're producing a water. Now I'm getting pretty close, and that right there would be, you are completely done that titration, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna record the final volume. Can you see there? I would say that is 20.58 and I would record that as my final volume. Now, that was a quick run, okay? So I'm gonna get you to stop the video. Okay. okay, so when you get really close to your end point, you do go drop by drop, and every time you have a drop, then you wanna swirl, and you'll notice that if I'm not swirling, I'm getting to that point where it's so close right now, I'm gonna get that last drop into my flask, and I feel like I've got the end point. As soon as that drop goes down, and I wish I'd brought some distilled water home, I don't, but if you were to add some distilled water to here, you'd be just fine, right? Because the water isn't doing anything, right? If you're adding water molecules to here, they're not doing anything at all. They're not reacting with anything. It's just already stuck together. So you can do that. You can um, spray some distilled water in, and then you're good to go, okay? Let me just show you that quickly again. So. If I were to get a little bit more base in here, okay, it's gonna turn back to the phenolphthalein. 
Okay, now, as I drop in the acid, one drop at a time, <clears throat> as soon as it reaches the end point of the titration, that is when the moles of hydroxide are equal to the moles of hydrogen ions, and then you've reached your end point. Okay, good. Okay, so I've got my um, base right now almost to that end point, okay? Can you see how it's really, really, really faint pink? And what you're looking for is when it goes that colorless and then back to faded pink, I would call this the end point. Now watch, if I drop just one more drop of acid in, okay, swirl it around, that's done. So now what we're going to do is have a look at the notes and I want you to just remember that all the instructions for how to do a titration, how to get the burette ready, how to read the end point, actually how to do the titration would be written right here. Um, I'm going to provide the little explore learning gizmo that you can give a try and on there it'll show you how to do it. You can practice um, adding some of the titrant to your acid or base and being able to do that calculation. But this is in real life. If you actually were going to do a titration, you would do this part. Okay, so there are some calculation questions on the back. Here's where we would do some observations. So I'll give you um, a volume of acid that we would use and um, and then I'll, I'll let you do some of the calculations with regards to, um, to this. Okay, we'll do some of the calculations together. Now, let's go over on here, just filling in the note on page 23 and 24, going over the instructional part. So in the video, you could see where I measured the volume of the titrant that would be in the burette. You want to remember that you read it to its limit. So every volume that you take from a burette will have two decimal places. You can read three decimal places right from the burette, and then you're going to estimate one value from there. Okay. So the first one here, can you see if you read at the bottom of the meniscus, it would be 13.23, and the second one would be 0 0.88. You're always reading from the top down. That's very important, right? This volume right here is not 1.13. It's 0 0.88. So you're always reading the volume, reading it from the top down. Okay? Now, I'll uh, pause the video and then fill in the rest of these volumes with me. Okay, 23.13, then did you guess 49.50, and then did you get 20.06 mils. So being able to read the burette accurately is only one part of the skills of doing your titration. When you do a titration where you're looking for your percentage error that you get in the end, this could be one step where you might be a little bit off. So you want to get really good at being able to measure this volume. The other part would be measuring the um, uh, volume accurately that you have in your volumetric pipette, right? That's another spot that let's say you're a little bit off with your reading of your pipette. That could factor into your percentage error. What if you, you know, you don't get that last little drop of acid or base in your pipette into your Erlenmeyer flask. That could be another spot where you have a little source of air. So when you're doing some analytical chemistry, when you're doing this, you want to be exact at every single stage along the way. Okay? And all of that contributes to having a really accurate read and then a very accurate calculation. All right, so you can see you've got your reading your burette. That's one of the skills. What did we do in this titration process? Well, the first thing we had to do because we had calcium hydroxide in a saturated solution, I wanted to filter out any of the solid residue that would be left. So the base that we're using is calcium hydroxide and the only ions that are in there, the only thing that's in there with my water is some calcium ions and hydroxide ions. Two hydroxide ions per every calcium ion because calcium has a two plus charge. Remember, we're going to get to that. Next step, I transferred my saturated base using a volumetric pipette. Okay, so here we go. Here is my base and I'm going to put my base using an accurate measurement into my Erlenmeyer flask, okay? Um, you're going to add a little bit of phenolphthalein to that Erlenmeyer flask, which I did, and what does it turn? It turns pink. So here's my setup of my um, titration that I'm going to use, all right? What do I know? I know the concentration of the acid. That is one of my knowns. The other thing I will be able to know 
is the volume that I dispense. That's why I'm using the burette, okay? So I know the concentration of my acid because I read it on the container and I know exactly which acid I'm using. And this one I used is 0 0.0400 moles per liter concentration. Volume, okay? I will read that from my burette and now I know how much acid is used to neutralize my base. What do I know down here? Do I know the volume? Yes, I put in exactly 10.00 mils. So what's my X here? That is my unknown concentration, okay? So what I'm trying to figure out using this titration, I've got two things that I know, and on one side, I've got one thing that I know on the other side, I could be titrating my acid with my base or my base with my acid. It doesn't matter which version you're using, but you'll know three things and you've got one thing that you're trying to solve, okay? So we call what's in our burette our titrant, and then we've got our solution down below, all right? So for the next part right here, let's have a look at what this was with the titration reaction between my calcium hydroxide and my 0 0.0400 moles per liter. You've got your balanced chemical equation. I've got my acid plus my base plus my salt plus my water. You can write your ionic equation. You can write your net ionic equation and then reduce it down so that it's a one to one to one ratio. What happened? I had my hydrogen ions from my hydrochloric acid. These reacted with my hydroxide ions from my calcium hydroxide. And when they reach together in the Erlenmeyer flask, I get my water. Okay, notice that you're canceling out, right? You're canceling out this side and this side. I'm canceling out my chloride ions and my chloride ions to be able to get my net ionic equation. Okay, next, what's happening inside the flask? The end point, the point at which the acid has neutralized all of the base, we use an indicator to do that. Okay, we chose pink. Why? Because the indicator is going to change color at the actual endpoint that I've got. So that's one of the things that a chemist will do. You'll actually choose which indicator you want to use based on the acid and base that you're using. Okay, so I've chosen the right indicator. Remember, phenolphthalein is pink when it's in the base and colorless when it's in the acid. Okay, so when the acid adds in, it will turn colorless right around the same spot where the acid drops. It'll then fade back to pink. And you could see that in the video, right? As those ions interact with each other to make that water, you're neutralizing the acid and the base. So why? There are less to collide with, right? And so that's gonna happen and it looks like this. Okay, so as I'm dropping my acid hydrogen ions into my solution, <clears throat> they're reacting with the hydroxides that are in there from the base, which turn pink, and as they combine together, they quickly neutralize and you're left with water, okay? And so once you get very, very close to that end point, you're reaching the point where the same number of hydroxides equal the same number of hydrogen ions and all you're left with is water, okay? So the solution turns that pale pink as a hydroxide remains and this would be the end point of the titration, okay? Last part of the lesson, I'm going to show you how to do the calculations and I'm going to show you which calculations I want you to give a try and submit, okay? So I'm going to give you a volume and this would be the volume that we used of our hydrochloric acid in order to neutralize the base that we've got. So this value right here, let's use 8.87 milliliters as the total volume of my 0 0.04 molar hydrochloric acid that was used to titrate my known volume of the base. So carry this number through. The other thing is that let's just come up with a temperature to say when we calculate the KSP it would be based on a room temperature of 22.7. Let's go with that value because there's a calculation you're going to do where you're going to compare um, the calculation in the lab, which would be at 22.7, and you're going to compare that to the known KSP of calcium hydroxide. But remember, the values from the table in the textbook 
are based on 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, so those two values carry them through. Which questions do I want you to answer? I'd like you to do question number one, question number two, omit number three, do question number four, and omit number five. Okay, so I'm just going to show you on this note where you can find the answer to question number four. It's given to you right in the notes. And, um, and then I'm going to move to a blank slide and I'll just show you how to sort of set up some of those calculations. Okay, so basically you're going to go back through. You're going to remember I looked up this value here. Where is it there? For the KSP of calcium hydroxide at 25 degrees. That number will carry through. You already have done your balanced chemical equation with the ionic equation and the net ionic equation. That is the answer to question 1a. This bottom part of page 24 I didn't explain, but I think you can read it and fill it in. That's the answer to question number 4. Okay, so please make sure you go through and you have a look at that instruction. All right, so let me take you to a note where I just sort of uh, filled in some of the calculations and I want to show you how to do these parts of the calculation, okay? So for question number one, and again, you're going to do question number one, question number two, and question number four. For number one, it's very easy. Again, the answer was already given to you for part A. You're going to do your titration reaction, balanced chemical equation, ionic equation, and the net ionic equation for that one. For part B, this is where we actually finally get to do some stoichiometry. So you're going to determine the concentration of the base. What is the concentration of the base? So again, how do you set that up? Well, you set that up by just writing out your balanced chemical equation. This is basic old stoichiometry, and this is just showing finally how to do it where we take our titration values and we put them into our balanced chemical equation. So our calcium hydroxide plus our hydrochloric acid gave us our calcium chloride and our water. What I like you to do is I like you to write the given right underneath the reactants in the formula. So then you can see where my starting point is, where my ending point is, and it very much helps you when you're doing a solving of a, when you're solving any kind of stoichiometry. So what was our values for our calcium hydroxide? Well, how much did we add? We added 10.00 milliliters. Don't forget you're going to convert that into liters. And how many significant digits? Don't drop the zero. Remember from my volumetric pipette, I added exactly 10.00 mils. Carry through all of those significant digits. Did I forget one? I just dropped one. I dropped a zero right there. Okay, so make sure you carry all the zeros from above down below. What's my x value? Well, I don't know what the moles per liter is. That's what I'm trying to solve. Okay, what are my knowns for my hydrochloric acid? I know that the concentration is 0 0.400 moles per liter, and the volume that we're going to use is 8.87 milliliters. Convert that into liters. Why not already just go ahead and do that? 0 0.00887 liters. That's how you're going to set up your titration, um, sorry, your stoichiometry calculation. I'm starting from here. I'm going to here. Go. Once you've got your calculation for your base, you know the concentration of the base. The next part of the question will then say, all right, if you know the concentration of your calcium hydroxide, Right? I know the concentration because I just calculated what it was from above. Then can you now tell me then if that's the concentration of my calcium hydroxide, what's the concentration of my calcium ions? What's the concentration of the hydroxide ions? You just use your unit analysis to figure that out and we know that it's a one to two ratio. Now, what do you do once you've got the concentrations of the ions? Well, now you can do question number two, where we actually take that concentration, and now we can figure out the KSP. So this is really the whole lab. Once you've got your concentration of your base using your titration, now I'm going to use that concentration to figure out the KSP of the slightly soluble solid, which was calcium hydroxide. Okay, so for this question, all you're going to do is uh, for two number A, I've already done two A for you. I'll post this note as an aside. 2B, now write your KSP expression, right? Concentration of the products over the concentration of the reactants. Now, 
put those concentrations in that you just solved for up here, calculate the KSP, and now all we're going to do for the very last calculation is let's take the accepted value, which is the answer for 4D, the one from the textbook, and calculate a percentage error. Now, why is our value going to be a little bit different than the value in the textbook? Well, you can think of it. You know that the temperature affects KSP. But then what if there was a little bit of that solid calcium hydroxide left, perhaps? The other thing you'll find is that the calcium hydroxide, when it reacts with the carbon dioxide in the air that's in the room, you get a bit of a white film at the top. So there's another solid there that's going to factor into throwing off perhaps the concentration because that's going to affect the equilibrium. Okay, so for question number two, once you've calculated your percentage error, then all you need to do for question number four is see the explanation that was given in the notes and then see if you can solve that. Okay, so that's it. We've now completed titrations and I did it in my kitchen and you did it from your own bedroom and um, I hope that was helpful. Okay, join us for the Google Meet on Friday afternoon at one o'clock if you have any questions from Equilibrium. That'll be fun.